Hello, my name is Tamar Fragman, and on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar on the topic of Jewish innovation and entrepreneurship, why it is key to our recovery. The Jewish innovation sector has fueled a renaissance in Jewish life over the past 20 years, enabling millions of individuals to find new ways to connect and stay connected to Judaism, Jewish experiences, and Jewish community by reimagining Jewish life. In this time of crisis, it is critical to not only preserve and advance the core systems that nurture new leaders, ideas, and ventures, enabling them to help Jewish institutions of all kinds adapt to, adapt to contemporary realities, but we must also embrace Jewish innovation as a core mindset of recovery and rebuilding. Today, we are fortunate to be joined with Aaron Catler, CEO of Upstart, Stephanie Rhodes, CEO of Slingshot Fund, Mamie Kempfer Stork, founding director and vice chair of Lippman Kempfer Foundation, for a living Torah to discuss how we can take the lessons learned from 20 years of nurturing and fueling innovation to create a roadmap for the post COVID Jewish community. So before I, I hand it over to Stephanie, I just wanted to let everybody know, we're gonna hear from our, our esteemed speakers for about a half an hour, and then I'm going to invite you all in to come and join so we can have an interactive conversation and it'll become more of a You'll, it will become like a Zoom meeting form and you'll be on screen or, or you can stop the video and not be on screen. Just want to say, warn you all about that, that you will get that invitation so that we can have a really robust interactive conversation. And with that, um, thank you all again. And Stephanie, off to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks for having us. Um, I can't see all of you. I see Aaron and Mamie and Tamar. But for now, I will say that when we do turn our screens on, I've started saying this with our slingshot meetings. Your partners, roommates, babies, pets, children, we all have them and they're surrounding us right now. So they're welcome into the screens as well. Hopefully mine will not appear, but if they do, I'll, I'll ask your, uh, your humor on that. Um, thank you for joining us today. This is certainly um, a conversation that Aaron and Mamie and I have been having together and separately. Um, I know that those of you who are on the call today are probably also joining us with a similar spirit. Um, and just to give us a sense before we get started for where you all are and you're thinking about all of this, we put together a little bit of a poll um, just with four questions, which Tamar will put up on the screen. Um, I don't know Tamar, am I gonna be, yeah, there it is. Okay, so if you could just answer these four questions, um, that'll just help us all get a sense for who's on the call and how they're feeling about this. So if you wanna know the answers, is number one, I already fund Jewish innovation, we have 95% that say yes and 5% that say no. Number two, I believe Jewish innovation is necessary for the vibrancy of Jewish life. 100% say yes. Number three, I believe Jewish innovation is a luxury and we have more important things to focus on right now. No, 74% say no and not sure is 26%. And number four, the most important thing we can do now is rebuild Jewish life. 37% um, said yes, 21% said no, and 42% said not sure. So if that helps show the diversity Excellent. of the group. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. I feel like we're in good company and in for a really interesting conversation when you all join us on the screen here in just a little bit. Um, look, I think um, JFN called and asked us if we would join you all for this conversation. I know that uh, with everything going on in the world right now and, and what, how COVID is affecting the Jewish community, there's a lot of question um, for some people about how important and, and relevant Jewish innovation is. I've heard um, from some folks, this is a back burner issue. We'll, we'll leave it till after um, we repair the Jewish community post COVID. Um, the three of us obviously believe that it is central to the rebuilding of Jewish life, um, that we can't afford to default to the factory settings. I'm quoting a April Baskin here, who on a call recently used that, and I just think it's such a brilliant way of articulating it. Um, you know, we've invested 20 plus years and millions and millions of dollars in building up the Jewish innovation and entrepreneur ecosystem. Um, it's increased engagement in Jewish life. It's brought in folks who otherwise were having trouble finding the door um, to Jewish life and define new ways of doing Jewish, um, making it meaningful and relevant and current. Um, and now in the midst of a global crisis um, and across every sector of Jewish life, we're imagining how we're gonna come out on the other side um, and what Jewish life will look like. Um, 
and and we have the tools and experts among us in the ecosystem um, to help us answer some of these questions. I think the funders of innovation and the practitioners who've been at this work reimagining Jewish life for 20 years plus um, have a lot to add to this conversation. Um, and, I'll, and I'll add one more thing. I think we all also agree that it's critical, the how we rebuild post COVID will be critical, um, including young people, Jews of color, women, disabled, um, Jews and LGBTQ Jews in the conversations in um, the funding uh, decisions that get made, including them both in how the funds get allocated and in allocating to them. Um, and this is sort of the framework for our conversation today. All of these pieces um, are the pieces of how we begin to imagine the three of us and we invite you to join us in imagining how to rebuild and repair post COVID. The structure of the call will be that tomorrow, um, Mamie, Aaron, and I will have a conversation, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll invite you to join us and we'll take you off of mute and we can just sort of um, throw this around. So I'll, we'll open with this. Um, I have a list of questions and maybe let's start with the big question. Um, if the pandemic is temporary, should we be focusing on innovations that respond to the moment um, or innovating for the future? Where does it fit into all of this? I'm, I'm, I throw this out to you both and let's get started here. All right, well, so I love this question partly because it, it creates for me a false dichotomy, right? The idea that, we, that solving the problems right now during the pandemic is not also helping us solve the problems of the future, you know, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. I mean, I'm personally, I'm really excited about some of the innovations I've been hearing about when it comes to how rabbis are connecting with their communities. And, you know, I have blessed to live in New York City where I have a bajillion synagogues to choose from and many, many rabbis who aren't part of synagogues to choose from in terms of learning and building my Jewish neshama. But that's not true for Jews who live all over the country. And so solving the problem right now of how we connect rabbis to their communities can be something that could blossom into a whole new way of connecting Jewishly no matter where you live in the future using digital tools and technologies. So like to me, the better we do at innovating for the moment, the better we'll do at innovating for the future. Aaron, what do you right, I'm actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. I think that the, we're not, the explosion of creativity that's been happening, that's been more visible um, online because people from anywhere can access anything and see you can shoal hop right now you can see creative programming around all around the world is inspiring creativity and that's been affirming for a lot of people And that's not solving the pandemic that's not solving uh, the crisis that we find ourselves in but it is a paradigm shift that is opening up for the future so it's a great catalyst in 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 some way it's a great catalyst um, for what the future could look like. I think I would also, it's also important and I can't see, we can't see everybody's faces, but I can see a lot of the names on the right side of my screen. And I, when, we do, when we do have the big reveal and see everybody's faces on the screen, I have a picture of what it's gonna look like in my mind. I have a picture of what the profile of the person on this call that 100% of people agree about funding innovation and 95% already do. Most people don't think it's a luxury most people think we do need to rebuild the community in some way. I have a picture in my mind of what the, the, the audience here looks like. And that is the biggest opportunity that we have to shift right here. That it's amazing to have 20 some people. We need 10 times that many people on calls like this. And hopefully I'll be surprised by the vast diversity that, that shows up on the Zoom screens. If it doesn't, that's the call to action for all of us. How do we expand what the, the, the voices are that are heard and that are speaking. Um, but that's, that's the catalytic moment that we're in right now. How do we take this as a, as a launching point, not, a, 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 not solving a crisis in the moment? It's interesting. I think one of the things um, I've heard is this, this idea or that I've been talking about, right? Like, it, this isn't, um, there's an opportunity for, I can't, pardon me, to sort of slingshot into the future um, on this, um, to this jumping off point um, that it isn't even, right? Like 
the dichotomy that we're talking about, which I appreciate that it's not just, there isn't one or the other, but I'm, I'm so excited by imagining what the future looks like if this moment is actually seen as an opportunity, right? There's um, so much money that's being invested in the community to build. And it, just imagine what would happen if we could jump off from where we were early March. Um, we're, you know, into God willing soon when we emerge from, um, from this moment. Um, and I just sort of wonder from where you both sit, like what's the, how do you think about that? How do you, how do we get there? Um, and, and get the folks who aren't on the phone with us even, right? Thinking about innovation as not um, a luxury, but a necessity. What's the framing? What's the, and I guess from where each of us sit, maybe useful to even think about our constituents um, and the, and the, role we play in this ecosystem right um so i would i would say um and i this is not that, not that controversial things in my mind sound much more controversial than they actually are but what and i'll be sensitive to the moment that we're in my hope is and stephanie you mentioned it that the innovation sector sort of was born 20 years ago um through a series of interventions in funding organizations like Slingshot or Upstart or Bikarim or Joshua Venture Group, present tenants and funders who got on board early to make all of that happen, like Mick McCanfer and others. And my hope is that this moment in time is sort of the final death blow for the innovation sector. I know that sounds strange and controversial, but to my mind, innovation is not a sector anymore. Innovation is not a thing anymore entrepreneurship and innovation are a mindset and that's the moment that we have to move towards not that you're either or or you have to be a startup or you have to be a legacy institution or you have to have an office of innovation or you have to have a, a, a skunk work somewhere that's creating new dynamic programming my hope is that this is finally the aha moment where what was a good idea six months ago is a mandatory idea going forward which is everybody regardless of what seat you sit in what role you play in the community the mindset shift is where we were is not where we want to be and we now see in a very intense uh, moment that hopefully we never experience again all of that come to light who's marginalized who has power who has authority what's working what isn't and how do we take this as an amazing opportunity to say who we actually have the opportunity to reshape the community right now changes that we were eking away at and clawing away to try to get to be more this or more that, now is we're called on to do that. How do we all mobilize to do that collectively from a mindset approach, not this tactic or that tactic? So that's my hope is that like we shift out of innovation as a tactic um, and think about innovation, entrepreneurship as a mindset that as a community we need to adopt because if we've learned anything over the last 20 years is that it works. And it, it, it does reshape the communities that we live in. It does reshape how people connect and find meaning in Judaism and in life. That's our mandate. Yeah. I, I have the same aspirations as you, Aaron. And like, it's very exciting to think about a world in, in a Jewish community that has adopted that mindset. I think from the conversations I've had with other funders, right, some of us are there already, that innovation is just part of the work and some of us are still getting there. Um, and seeing integrated. And I think you're right that, that the chance for funders to see innovation now as integral is higher, you know, also for us, not just for the organizations who are doing it, but for funders to look at organizations saying, how are you responding to this moment? How are you embedding innovation into your work? At the same time, I think being innovative in your funding is a lot harder. Right? Like the, the innovations in funding that I've been seeing coming out of this is how do we streamline our grant making processes? How do we make it easier on the reporting side? How do we you know, do quick you know, emergency grants? Those kinds of things, which are all super important. And we should have been doing these anyways decades ago. Right? The funding process itself is so cumbersome for so many organizations that we should be approaching our work with how do we make it more efficient? How do we be better partners? How do we be more responsive? But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're being innovative, right? That to me is being responsive to what the moment needs, but not necessarily being innovative. 
And some of the ways that funders are innovating when we look outside of the Jewish community, things like bringing um, the people who are most impacted by their funding into the conversations about how that funding gets allocated, right? Not just turning to the researchers and the academics and the experts to talk about you know, what's happening in the field, but to actually talk with the people who are being impacted um, by the work. That is much harder to do, and it's even much harder to do right now when we can't really be all together, right? We can't be having board meetings and bringing people in to learn from them in the same ways. It's harder to connect with people virtually. So I think there's a big opportunity and, and we haven't yet figured out as funders how to do our own funding really in innovative ways. It's interesting. I think we're, we're in this time where there's an urgent, like we have the sense for urgency, but there's also so much we need to learn because I'm with you, Mamie, I feel, you know, at Slingshot and, and with the work that we're doing with young philanthropists, um, it's how do you think about who's not at the table and what questions aren't being asked? Um, and there's, so I think there's a lot of learning and the kind of learning that really takes time to think about how to be more inclusive and how to um, hear those voices um, at our tables of decision-making um, and, and so it's sort of you're holding two truths, right? It takes time to really do that work and get really good at it. And we're in the middle of a, of a situation that is urgent. And so I just want to name that. We're feeling it. Um, I know, you know, you both are too. We've been talking about that also. So I guess, right, like interesting. Here we are on a, um, a JFN call and we're in three different locations geographically. And um, Having these conversations is new um, for JFN to be doing. I know we've been doing a lot of online stuff. Erin, I know you have. Um, so just, I think, like I'm curious for what do you both think about what we need to let go of, right? Like old frameworks, power dynamics, like how do we embrace this, you know, with the, with the holding two truths, um, what do we need to, what needs to change? Not just the, you know, in order for us to get there, the hurdle that we face in, in getting 10 times as many people into this conversation with us. So I would, I would say that the, the first thing, you know, there's the, um, the good to great metaphor of the windows and mirrors, right? And most people are probably familiar with that, that like when things are challenging, you can either look out the window or you can look in a mirror and you can look at what others are doing or you can look at yourself and own your own actions. And I think this is a, this is a moment, obviously this is a crisis moment that everyone's dealing with the immediacy in their own way, whether you're a funder or an entrepreneur or in a, in a traditional institution. Um, but I think it's an important moment it's an important mirror moment, right? Like it's an important moment for everybody, regardless of your role, individual funder to institutional funder to not just tell people and grantees or others that this is the time to buck up and ask yourself the hard questions. This is the time for everybody to look in the mirror and ask themselves the hard questions. And I think that the, the, the filter for those hard questions are how can we demand of ourselves and others to do better with less? Right? How do we minimize, how do we make the most efficient processes that we possibly can, not bare bones and not that operations don't matter, operations matter more, not that reserves don't matter, they matter more, but how do we demand that people, that organizations and everyone maximizes every dollar that's invested because there are, there are not enough philanthropic dollars to save everything that is at risk right now. So how do we do that? I think demanding that people think about sustaining missions and not organizations is critical right now. Mm -hmm. How do we all, in whatever role we play, foster collaboration in a real way? How do funders fund collaboration? How do executives and organizations open themselves up to collaboration in real ways that may end up in consolidations, may not? But how do we all go into those conversations openly when those are dangerous and risky and heavy conversations to have? How do we all operationalize our values? Everybody has great values in their organizations. Most of them are similar. We all care about empathy and the opportunity and optimism and collaboration. How do we operationalize those and hold each other accountable to them? Grantees and funders, should every grant request include 
um, the leading edge survey that an organization does every year to talk about how we're doing internally as an organization. And should every foundation have to participate in the leading edge survey, survey and share that openly to say how they're doing on diversity inside their organizations. Those are some questions that we should all be asking. Um, and I think it really comes from like asking those hard questions in the hope of advancing the collective work um, and, and using this as an opportunity again for that, that sort of evolutionary leap to a different place that we all wanna be, but it's gotta come with looking in the mirror first. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would build on what you're saying, Aaron. You know, I think some of the things that we have to let go of are the, the processes and the systems and the bureaucracy that make us feel safe. And I'm speaking as a, as a funder, right? There's a lot of safety that comes from feeling like I get these requests, I can read through all these materials, I can have many conversations, we can like, you know, look at this in our portfolio. Right? There's a lot of kind of safety that comes from I'm making a good investment by going through all of these steps. And we don't have the luxury and I, I call it a luxury because for the organizations who are doing this work, it doesn't matter if it's a pandemic, right? They are constantly in the, in the weeds with it. So it's really a luxury that funders take to spend three months or six months or a year in conversation with an organization before we decide to make a gift. And you know, to be able to let go of those, the kind of things on the periphery that give us that sense of safety and to be able to step into taking risks. And I, I see that um, Arnie put a question in the, in the q a so if other i just want to call it out for other people on the call if you have questions you can put it into the q a chat piece um, and we'll we'll try and touch on those All right so if you're now in a position where you can kind of let go of some of the things that gave you this this what i would say is a false sense of safety many times um, and step into some new levels of risk taking and get comfortable with taking risks um, that is a would be a huge transformative piece of how funders do their work. Um, and it's not, it's not so easy. Stephanie, go ahead. You want to no, I just think in general funding right now is going to be risky. There's so many questions about what's going to make it through, what's going to still be around in a year and a half, whether that is innovative new startups or old institutions, right? The one thing we know from this is that nobody's immune to the impact and arguably some of the smaller, more um, innovative scrappy startups are the ones that are better positioned right to weather a storm um not always but some of them right so uh i guess i'm just sort of saying like i agree with you and it's a it occurs to me that any you're doing uh, grant making is risky right now whatever it is you invest in is risky right now so how um how do you think about that risk um in an intentional way towards building towards the kind of future that we want, right? I think. I mean, I would say to that, um, I, I think the first step is to define your risk tolerance, right? Define what risk means to you. Does it mean every grant has to have an element of risk or there's a pool of money that is allocated towards riskier and defining what risky means that if it isn't, if it doesn't hit all these metrics, it's, it's a failure or, um, you know, defining what risk means to you and then find ways to mitigate, the, mitigate that risk. Um, I think that right now, I think in general, it's a good practice, but right now more than anything, like you said, like you both said, it's a riskier time to make investments right now. There's less certainty about the effectiveness of grants right now. Emergency grants might solve a, a short-term problem for an organization that won't be here in six months, right? So those are risks. I think the, the, the need to invest in R&D and innovation is something that is always that should be an always do, not a now do. Um, and maybe maybe a way to mitigate your risk is to pool funds. And you can lose, you can you can risk a little bit less by being part of a pooled fund initiative where there's more going to a sector or an organization and you run the risk of, of hedging a little bit or you wanna hedge a little bit more. Um, so I think defining what your risk tolerance is, finding the ways to mitigate that, finding trusted partners that are working in, the, in sectors, that you can delegate that authority to. I think those are important ways, but I think having a pool of funds, if I were telling funders what to do, which I guess is what I'm doing, um, uh, I would say have an allocation of funds that you, you see as risk investment, that it's intentionally for that purpose, and then make the wise decisions based on what you wanna see advanced and who you see doing that work. I wonder, um, there's a bunch of really great questions coming up and my, my instinct is to call them out and start to answer them. 
but maybe this is a good time tomorrow for us to open up and let's let everybody in and start to have this conversation live. Well, so as you're doing that, I want to just give a shout out to a, a book that I'm reading right now called Delusional Altruism. That is by um, Chris Walker Lee Putnam. I have it like sitting and I can't quite read because my glasses aren't that strong yet. Um, but I can grab it and, and show everyone. But it, it talks about the um, kind of things that the mistakes that funders may make and what we can do differently. And a lot of what we're talking about here, I'm reading in her book. And I highly recommend, it's a great place to start, I think, for funders who want to kind of rethink how they're doing their giving right now. Um, so I'd highly recommend it. And I can put it into the chat, um, a link to it into the chat for anyone who wants to see it. Thanks. I think while everybody's coming in, maybe um, we can get to some of these questions. Um, as you look towards the next 12 months, what do you think are the most important problems in the Jewish world that need greater innovation? Uh, my take on that is, um, Everything, everything, right? Um, all of the issues, whichever, whatever your philanthropic priorities are or focus is, um, the moment, I, I think that's the whole premise of this conversation, right? Is that the moment demands um, greater innovation across the board, greater um, internal entrepreneurialism and letting go a sort of um, old power dynamics and frameworks um, and really um, thinking about new ways to collaborate with others and deliver your work and partner and so you know one of the things Aaron and I have been talking about a lot kind of on the side and in between all the zoom calls we've been on um, together is for all of the organizations that are um, having to let folks go or or you know, scaling back tremendously. On the other side of this, there'll be so many fantastic entrepreneurs that are there and ready and in the wings and can sort of take over some of um, the gaps that are left in the wake of COVID um, as one example of, of something I could imagine. So I'm, I'm less inclined to sort of focus in on a particular problem to call the most important and to just my take on your question is really that this is like a shift in mindset um, across the board. I don't know, Mimi, Aaron, the rest of you, welcome. It's good to see folks. You know, I, I think for me, when I think about the next 12 months, I think about what are all the things that need, that are going to happen that we can't do normally. So there's a lot of stuff that, you know, we're, we're kind of living in the muck of day to day and trying to solve for those kinds of things. And it's been really amazing to see how people are doing brisses and bat mitzvahs and mm -hmm. all of those things. But I'm thinking about like the high holidays, like that's going to be a, that's a big thing that needs a lot of attention and we can't start thinking about it three weeks before. Um, right. Other, other things are going to come up in the Jewish life cycle. Um, college, you know, college campus, like how are we engaging students when they're not on college campuses, when, you know, if schools remain closed in the fall, um, you know, how are we kind of tackling some of these really big questions? Because they're not um, as easy as, you know, we'll just figure it out. Um, so that, that's to me is kind of some of the spaces is just like, what are the big things that the whole community is grappling with? Yeah, there's some really actually very cool tikkuns coming up for Shavuot that are taking folks from around the country um, into some all night learning situations that I know I'm looking forward to, which never would have happened without this. Yeah, and I would say to both of those points, I would say that the, the, the meta challenge in 12 months feels like a minute um, when we think about what the next several years are going to feel like. Um, but I think what both what you guys are saying is that gathering, right? How people come together is a huge challenge and you can look sector by sector, group by group, but how people actually come together is so core to how people find meaning. And that clearly is challenged to its core right now. Um, and so what that looks like over the next 12 months, stops and starts, um, risks, no risk, things like that. So I think gathering in general from like, from sort of a, a delivery perspective is a huge challenge, but I think the other biggest area to my mind that is in dire need of that exponential sort of evolutionary leap is philanthropy um, over the next 12 months. Um, the things that, the way things have been funded, the way the, that mechanism works in general, it, it's clear. 
I think in a lot of ways that that need that that would benefit from a, a, a an adaptation um, over the next 12 months of how you make how funders make decisions um, what is funded what isn't what sort of collaborations evolve and emerge um, I think that is going to be you know it, it can't just be a collection of pardon the expression but a collection of death panels deciding what which of their interests get to live and not organizationally it has to be a collective and one of the fatal flaws of entrepreneurship when we talk about entrepreneurship and innovation one of the fatal flaws is the ego that goes along with being an entrepreneur of thinking my idea is the best and only my idea can succeed and i am the one who can save the world and that's a great catalyst to get out there and do some amazing things also doesn't necessarily lend itself always to collaboration and partnership and that has to happen now on all sides um, both from people who are starting running advancing programs but also how funding it helps to advance that because you can't have a collaboration without people putting the money up to make those things happen. Yeah. I'm definitely seeing what <laughs> you're talking about with our folks at Slingshot. People are just hungry for information and trying to figure out how to, how to do this well and to how to overcome some of the power structures that are at play um, and to include a more diverse pool of voices. So I, I share that only to say like, I'm hopeful. I share your, vision for that, Aaron, and I'm hopeful that we're heading in the right direction if, if the next generation is any indication. Um, put a question in. Now, what are you hearing from the field and the organizations you work with around mergers and consolidations? Are people generally scared, not interested, excited by the prospect? Um, and how can funders support these conversations? I'm curious, I feel like yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, maybe go ahead. I've, I've heard of a few organizations that are having these conversations, um, but all of them were also having these conversations before this started. So I don't know to what extent the pandemic is spurring more of that, but at least for the ones that I know of, it hasn't inhibited them, which I think is a real thing that could have happened where organizations kind of retreat into a, I need to preserve myself. This is not the time to be putting ourselves into a more complicated mess when we have, are just trying to survive. So from that perspective, I think the organizations who are already heading down those paths are still very much interested in finding ways to, um, to merge or to get stronger by joining forces. Yeah, I see that too. Um, it's what will get us through this, what will make us stronger. And I would say I'll actually like add um, another dynamic to that, which is that I have this sense that the partnerships between organizations and how we can lift each other up and um, work together strategically, it feels more um, concentrated now than I felt in the past. Um, yeah, Aaron, I don't know. You also have your own unique yeah, I mean, take I, on it, I, I'm sure. Yeah, right, so I can speak from the upstart perspective, which I've been doing this whole time, but I'll just name it more explicitly here um, in two ways. One, we are the product of a merger, right? Um, three years ago or so, we, we finished a four-way merger. Um, and we also are looking at it for our network right now, which is 150 uh, organizations that are, you know, from the $5 million down range in budget size. And what are they thinking nationally? And what are they thinking about? And our first, our first response to the crisis was an emergency fund, keep people in jobs with healthcare for 90 days in our network. That was our first out of the gate. What can we do? How can we support our network? Um, and we did that. We raised and distributed $800,000 in emergency grants. Great, wonderful. While that was happening, I don't mean to diminish it, but at, while that was happening, we also listened to what our folks were saying and wanted to anticipate their needs. And the ones who weren't thinking about collaboration, consolidations, and closings were already off track, right? To our estimation, they were already missing the next wave, which was not a two-year wave. It was a six-month wave of that's happening. And so we tapped into the resource that we worked with through our merger, La Piana Consulting, which many of you may know. Their expertise is in the technical aspects of mergers and acquisitions in the nonprofit sector and have been building a suite of resources to go beyond our network, to our network and beyond, to help learn what does it mean to go from collaboration to consolidation to closing? What does that spectrum look like? And we're launching that in our next phase, which is sometime after today, um, between today and 
12 months. Uh, but uh, no, in the, next, in the next few months, launching that as a suite of resources because that, that spectrum of collaboration to consolidation doesn't happen without relationships. And how do people, those exist in some places and in many places they don't, but you don't go from zero to merger overnight or else it's real ugly. And we've talked to our network. We've asked people in our network, what are you thinking about it? And the majority of them say, yeah, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it a lot. I'm thinking about, am I going to be here? Is our organization going to be here? And how do I sustain it? And quietly in one-to-one -one conversations, it triggers the same things it triggered for me four years ago when I took this job and I was hired to say, lead upstart. And maybe it won't exist in six months because you're going into a merger. The first thing you think about is, what does that mean for me and my job? And nobody wants to be in the job market right now. So it is a direct threat to people's you know, financial stability, personally and organizationally. But again, it's not, it's not a binary option. There are a multitude of options within that of partnerships and consolidations that can help and maintain that and raise it. Yeah, well, and I wanna um, note, Erin, because you're, the process that you all went through was so deliberate. And that I think has, we, we see the benefit of that. And that was supported by funders. So they gave you, and I will give a shout out to my family's foundation. You should. That work. Yeah, you should. Uh, right? but that, and we, we weren't the only ones, right? So um, to Rebecca's second point of how can funders support these conversations, right? Like giving organizations grants for general operating support or specifically to help them have the time and the space to be able to have those conversations is really helpful because for most of the people who are going to be in those conversations, right, it's the most senior staff. And their time is so valuable and often spent doing fundraising work and other really strategic work. So for them to take that time and go and have the, the real depth of conversations they need to have around collaboration, partnership, consolidation, and merging, right, being able to help them take some of the fundraising load off their plate by giving them grants and specifically saying, like, we want you to be having those conversations so that they know that that's, that's why you're, you're helping to support it can be really powerful. And I, I will be more explicit with the shout out to your foundation because it was, not only was it incredibly important and a relatively small dollar amount that made it possible, right? $25,000 to engage a consultant um, to start a conversation. And that didn't only buy, buy the bottles of wine. I know there was more money than that, but um, <laughs> there was an alcohol subsidy in there, I'm sure, um, to start those conversations. Um, but the, the secret sauce to the funding that got the, that process started, and I wasn't there at the beginning, I inherited it, was it was funding without an agenda. It was funding it without saying, you must merge when this is done, or you must create one entity, or it must look like this. It was saying, start a conversation, see where it goes. You're in the business of efficiency and effectiveness. Go there and to support it throughout. So it's the funding without the outcome in mind that is so important, like you were saying, sort of general operating in that sense. And correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, that conversation, as I have always understood it, was really driven by the organizations, right? Like yep. it wasn't handed down that you needed to get into this conversation. It was your own. For sure. So I think there's something there too to pay attention to. For sure. And last thing I'll say on, that, on, a, on the merger point, I guess, is that was in good times. Right. That was in times of abundance. That was in times of there's plenty of room to think and to blue sky things and whiteboard and imagine possibilities. And it took two years and probably half a million dollars, not counting hours put in. It's expensive. It, it takes time. It's complicated to imagine that that's going to happen in a systemic way and strategic and ordered way in the next six to 12 months without some significant financial intervention is a fantasy. Um, it's not. And the job for all of us is to ensure as little chaos as we can, right, as we go through all this process to maintain the intellectual assets and the advances that have been made. So those things don't get lost through this process. So yes, funding for projects, funding for mergers, but funding for data maintenance and IP uh, storage and advancing all of the benefits of things that have been built over the last however many years, not just from the innovation sector um, is critically important, right? Like that's super, super important. And it takes time and it takes money, but that's not an excuse not to do it because the alternative is not great. 
I would also you know offer that I, I, I would imagine, I see from our folks, and I'm just looking at who's on this phone, there's a piece of this which is overwhelming to everybody, right? No matter what role you're playing right now, there's so many questions about how to play that role well and strategically and thoughtfully. And I guess if I could just sort of punctuate this with um, the idea that none of us actually really, like, thank God, right? None of us have ever done this before. Um, and what an opportunity is it to be in real true partnerships between the funders and the organizations that you support. You don't need to have the answers. How great would it be to pick up the phone and call the organization you've been supporting and find out how you can be helpful? Um, or for the organizations to feel like the relationship with you is strong enough that they can pick up the phone and say, listen, I know we were supposed to um, do this project, but we're gonna really need to do this instead. Um, and I guess that's just, that's sort of a call I would make, like to the extent I think that we can all be in partnership with each other is the extent to which we come out of this strategically strong and, um, you know, embracing tradition and innovation and moving forward from a place of strength. Anyway, I mean, um, I'm looking no, at- just felt like the right thing to say. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you who I'm just meeting today and who, who don't know, I used to work at JFN and I was actually there in 2008 during the financial crisis and during some of our natural disasters. And I can say it's been, um, I am delighted and moved by the shift that I've seen in, in the community's response where I believe at that, that you know, years ago, there was a wait and see and trying to really wrap our head around what's going on here before any major investments were made. And it, it there are so many question marks, arguably more than there were during um, the times I'm referring to. And I, you know, from where I'm sitting, it does not seem like folks are holding back. I, I've been really thrilled to see how much people are jumping in. Um, I don't know, Dean or Tamar, if you see things differently or any of you all who so, um, are in I'm that. To jump in here. Um, I actually met Stephanie when she was at JFN. So. <laughs> Um, I, um, I think what we're seeing, we're seeing that um, funders recognize it's time to take bold moves. Um, so that's, I think that's probably the most predominant trend. There are definitely funders who are thinking about how to keep some powder dry because we don't know what's coming um, and trying to be sort of strategic about what that, what that might look like and to create the right balance between boldness and, um, and sort of being careful. Um, what I, what I think we're seeing more of are cl clearly in terms of like um, the grantee um, funder relationship and how uh, funders are stepping up in terms of being supportive, whether it's requirements, fund, you know, reporting requirements or when gifts are made and those kind of allocations is much, um, is just incredible amount of um, thoughtfulness and intentionality around nimbleness here. Um, and the other thing um, we're seeing um, is um, a real um, ability to pivot, mostly in the um, individual funders and smaller family foundations who have historically been giving in a particular direction but recognize that need is showing up in all different sectors and are ready to move into different sectors and are actually relying on the expertise of their colleagues within the network um, and recognizing we've never funded in human services before and we have colleagues in the network who have, what can we learn from them? But we don't have time and bandwidth to do our due diligence and to do, you know, that we would historically do. There is no time for that. There's no, um, it's just everything is too urgent. Um, and so they're making those kind of pivots and relying on colleagues and collaboration. And so I think that's another uh, significant trend we're seeing. And it's part of a sort of innovative mindset shift um, that we're seeing play out and, and how funders are approaching their work now. And I want to kind of just build off that real quickly and that I think there's um, what I'm seeing is there's actually almost like three categories of funders right now. There's institutional funders who have endowments who for the most part are being or dipping into their endowments who are um, giving more and taking advantage of the fact that this moment has big needs. There's um, kind of the funders who are probably part of JFN who are individuals with small family foundations or significant assets who are also stepping up in real ways. And then there's a band of funders who many organizations rely on whose primary source of their giving was their work. And for those funders, there's so much uncertainty. Many of them have gone down to become one income households or they have taken major pay cuts. And that is where I think 
the organizations are really okay. feeling it because those funders are not giving or not giving as much. Um, and, and, it's, and it's clear why, right? Like this, it's not because they don't care or they're not trying to step up. It's their, their economic situation is so different than funders who have significant assets and wealth and savings and endowments. I mean, I think, I think trust is, you know, is, a, is, is an idea to unpack. And I think when we talk about how do you build trust, well, you build it over time and you build it through, uh, through multiple steps of testing and validating and all of that. And I think that is really hard to do right now. So it's how do you leverage trust? How does, how does, how does a group of folks who trust another group of folks expand the, the tentacles of trust? during a period like this where I can't hop on a plane and meet any of y'all uh, right now, right? Like, but those things that would, would help build trust and build relationships just can't happen right now. Um, I think one of the biggest impediments to building trust and making trust-based decisions over the next whatever period of time, short, medium, long, is data and information. There is a, a huge gap in what we know and to make data informed, not necessarily data driven, but data informed decisions about where to fund, what to fund, how to fund, is gonna require the aggregation of all of this data that's being pooled by whether it's JFNA, JFN, J whatever, anything, anyone who's collecting data, us, anybody who's collecting data from community surveys and studies and grant processing, how we can finally in some way aggregate that data to say, this is the collective need, this is the collective work. How can we make wise investments? And I know that's pie in the sky. It's, it's very hard to do that, but there are smart ways to take those steps. Right before this all hit, middle of February, I was on an encounter trip, Upstart Network Alum Encounter Program. And the advice we were given the first day of the trip was your goal, with Stephanie, um, your goal uh, on this trip, uh, Steph, correct me if I'm wrong, paraphrasing, your goal is to right size the problem, right? right-size the problem for yourself, mm -hmm. find the way that you can make a difference, practically and tangibly. That's our challenge here in this moment. How do mm -hmm. we all right-size the problem and then operate at 100% in our lane? And if everybody does that and we have some way of aggregating that knowledge, we'll be okay. But what a 12 to 24 months looks like from here, who knows, right? But for right now, we need to be building those relationships on transparency, and communication in ways that we normally wouldn't. And I feel like I just, I have to say this given um, if any of you were following some of the questions about the way data was gathered and presented over the past week, I would say if you have questions about numbers or any of that where you're not quite sure where, which to follow, um, I love what Dina highlighted about what's going on over at JFN. Um, the network is so huge that you could likely find Folks who've been involved in funding in the area or with the lens that you're looking to get involved with, that you could do some of your own research and not potentially rely um, on one or two pieces or of, of data um, if, if, if you're finding conflicting information and not sure what to do. One of the things you can think about dealing with your board um, and your donors is the notion of leverage. Um, and collaboration and conversation with other funders who are in your space or have pivoted into your space and what might be done in partnership or in collaboration or in staged or allied funding, whatever it might be, could be an interesting conversation to have when there is a sort of a desire to keep some powder dry or to take a step back because it doesn't have to be all you alone, right? And if that may have been the way you've been approaching your philanthropy to date, um, there's a way to shift it and to rethink what it looks like to be more collaborative and if you want to have an offline conversation about, you know, who we can connect, you know, that's what the network's for. So you should just let us know. And I would add just a note of emphasis on that. I think, Dina, 100% JFN plays a critical role in connecting and the transmittal of trust in that way. And I would say everyone on this call, hopefully um, it's an opportunity to look in the mirror because you're seeing yourself on Zoom, like we talked about before. But what are, you gonna, do, what are you gonna do differently after this call? What are you gonna do? You have, you have Dina and Tamar, who are great resources. You have Stephanie, Mamie, myself, other peers on this call that are resources if you wanna make a difference right now and you wanna increase your philanthropy and you wanna do it in a directed, smart, tangible way, you have the resources right here, will you? And I'll, I think maybe I'll close because I see the time with our call to action. Um, the three of us 
in prepping for this, um, our sort of call to action, I guess, is invest in innovation, rethink philanthropy, include innovation um, and di diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, which includes Jews of color, women, disabled, LGBTQ, um, in the rebuilding of Jewish life. And don't forget to invite young people to those tables too, because what we're finding is they were ready to adapt to this and to jump on Zoom and to, to um, adapt very well. And I think let's learn from all of those folks and get all of those voices at the table. Um, we're here. If you want to continue the conversation, tomorrow's got our contact information. I speak for Aaron and Mamie and offering some of our time if it's helpful to any of you. And thanks for including us and for showing up for the conversation today. Tamar, thanks. Thank you. And Thank Dina. You, Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mamie, for this incredible conversation. You brought so much important content to us and led us to really thought-provoking conversations. And like we said, this, can, this really should just be the beginning. I'm here to help you connect with each other and also look out for programming going forward that might also interest you on this and on other subjects. And so for now, I'll say goodbye and stay well and looking forward to learning with you all again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.